right. Well, welcome, everybody. We will kick off our uh, Pivoting During the Pandemic panel. Good alliteration there. Well done, Derek and team. So uh, thank you again, uh, Bees Knees Coffee, for providing our uh, sweets and yummy treats up there. So uh, much appreciated as part of that. So uh, I'm Tim Simpson, a professor here at Penn State, going on 20-plus uh, years, uh, mechanical engineering and industrial engineering. Good evening over there. How are you? Uh, and we're all going to share sort of our pivot story and what's been going on and how the pandemic has been uh, adjusting us and our companies and lessons learned and all those sorts of things. We have a very diverse panel in terms of uh, companies and uh, startups and businesses and jobs that are out there. So we're going to let them quickly introduce themselves and then we'll uh, jump into what's a pivot and what did we all do. So would you like to kick us off? All right, everyone. I am Dr. Cheryl Robinson. I am an international speaker, founder of Ready to Roar, and I have a column at Forbes Women where I actually study how people successfully pivot in their careers. I've interviewed over 500 individuals on the art of pivoting and my dissertation is also on the art of pivoting so i am here to share with you the data in a really fun way of how you can pivot and just quick hands i know we're supposed to talk about ourselves sure. but i'm just i'm going to pivot, pivot real quick how many of you have pivoted in your life all right how many of you have successfully pivoted in your life? Awesome. All right. We are going to get back to that later, but thank you for letting me know. So also, real quick, I have 15 years of experience in sports and entertainment where I worked with athletes. I helped put together events, anything for them off of the field, so galas, foundations, basketball camps. Uh, and then I started Ready to Roar, which I have pivoted eight times now, the functionality of the company. So that's a quick snapshot. Oh, excellent. Thank you. And some good cliffhangers there for later so stay tuned so Maureen I was like uh, the ready to roar so you're in a great place uh, exactly. you know Nittany Lion totally. Roar right totally. there you go hi everyone um, my name is Maureen Mulvihill and I'm president and CEO of Actuated Medical we're located in Belfont Pennsylvania about 10 minutes from here you know down uh, down 99 right so pre-COVID we are a medical device innovator. We've developed several different devices. Our first device on the market is a device that clears feeding tubes while the tube stays in the patient. So as we talk about COVID, we can talk about where I was when COVID hit, but that's different. Um, but I'll talk about my pivot when we come back. But I have 22 employees and we all love what we do. Just takes a second. There we go. There you go. Um, hi, uh, Justin Rosenberg. I'm founder and CEO of a restaurant chain called Honey Grow. Um, we are in the Philadelphia region. We have 26 locations, but started the business in Philly. I'm a Penn Stater. I graduated in 04. I was a history major and Spanish minor, and I pivoted somehow to the restaurant business. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, during COVID, it's, I, I'm pivoting like every other day. So I'm happy to talk about it with you guys. <laughs> it's pretty crazy, <laughs> um, but I'm flattered to be here. All right. Well, we're going to we're going to start out with an easy question, which is of course, what actually is a pivot, at least technically speaking, and then <laughs> based on your experience, please. All right. I like this to be engaging if you haven't noticed by now. So, how many of you feel like you have a good idea of what pivoting actually means? What what's a good definition? Anyone? Please don't make me have to call on you. Anyone? Go ahead. Changing your career, all right. Anyone else? Go ahead. Yes, you were the first person to say that. I love that. So here's the thing. Every single one of you has pivoted at least a thousand times today. Is that mind blowing? So in a thousand times a day that you pivot, what do you think you're pivoting? Anyone want to guess? Go ahead. Your task? Yep. Go ahead. Decision making? Decision -making? One more. Anyone else want to throw it out? 
All right, there are three different types of pivoting. You pivot your mindset, so that goes decision making and task making. You pivot personally and you pivot professionally. Today we're gonna to be talking about professional pivots, but those are the three types of pivoting. Now, earlier, Maureen and I were talking, and what was the question that came up? Well, I said that we didn't necessarily do a pivot during COVID because we still maintained the business we were doing, and she said, ah, oh. yeah. but the definition of pivot. Yep. So there are so many def different definitions. So when it comes to professional pivoting in business, yes, it could mean that your business is doing one thing, you stop doing that, and then you pivot to doing a different product, you know, offering a different product or service, or it means you continue doing it, but then you expand, and the expand is a pivot as well. And that's what Maureen did. She expanded, she pivoted. So not all of your focus is on one thing, but it's on multiple things. And pivot, if I can go a little bit longer, are we good? Okay, I don't want to take the whole show. But uh, with pivoting, when professional pivots, you have, does anyone know what a professional pivot is? The categories, want to throw one out? It's when you get fired, you get laid off, the company goes under, you pivot up in one company. So say you go from assistant to manager to VP to CEO. You pivot industries, fashion, say auto or sports, or you pivot within companies but within the same industry. So that's your general term of pivoting, but you do pivot a thousand times a day. Where, where's the posture pivots, right? <laughs> how, much, how many of those do we change? So, speaking of pivoting, I want to hear on a restaurant business, when all of a sudden your customers can't come in, order food, all those sorts of things, kind of have to pivot. So Definitely have to pivot. So, um, you know, I remember that Wednesday night, and just to give some context, so we, we're like a fast casual company that does freshly made stir fry salads. Um, you come in to order, we have a touchscreen technology when you order on a kiosk. And prior to the pandemic, about 70% of our business was, were folks coming in to order. About, call it 20% of our business was um, mobile app and website. The remainder was catering and 8% of the business was like DoorDash, Uber Eats, Caviar, et cetera. So Wednesday night, I'm out to dinner with a friend of mine. We're getting our, our phones are blowing up. There's travel bans. There's, you know, all this stuff. MBA is canceled. We're like, what is going on? Oh, my God. Uh, the week prior was in Los Angeles. Somebody wore a face mask on the plane. We're like, what is this guy? <laughs> like, what is that? Um, <laughs> lo and behold. So that Wednesday, we realized that Wednesday night, like, oh, my God, this world is completely crazy. What's going on? By Friday, we realized we have a big problem. We have a huge problem. You went through this. I'm sure you went through this as well. Like It was a very scary moment. Nobody really knew what the disease was. Nobody really knew how you can get it. Um, I remember people were afraid to order food. And so supermarkets were just getting slammed. Uh, we saw our sales drop 70%, 7-0, 70% overnight. And we, have, we had at the time about 700 employees, 20 people in the office. And it was like, are we going to survive this thing? You know, how are we going to do it? That Friday, out of the gate, we said, look, you know, we had a thesis of, I think most people will eventually want to order food, and we need to make it so they feel safe and they feel okay. And that means they may not want to go in the restaurant. And by the way, we were luckily um, considered an essential business. So we, we fell in the same category, which meant that we can stay open, but folks were not allowed to come into the restaurant. We took our mobile app, we added a curbside pickup feature, and it kept us alive. So we did that on that Friday, and the world changed for us. It was 55% of our business now was mobile app, 45% of our business was um, third party, and third party is a whole conversation about that and pricing. Um, but you fast forward today, we're 40%, still 40% uh, third party, DoorDash, Caviar, Grubhub. And of course, you know we had to reduce corporate expenses and lose people. and. You know, it was it was hard. It was a lot of micro pivots, if you will, in that process to really turn the boat. But um, you know, luckily we we did it. Awesome. Speaking of face shields, Speaking if I may, segue, please, Maureen. So okay, so 
We were a medical device manufacturer. Everything we do is FDA compliant. We were on this incredible um, email chain with Tim and a whole bunch of people from Penn State, and all of a sudden there's this PPE shortage, and we're like, you know, I got a bunch of engineers that work for me, right? They're like, oh, we can solve that. So we started producing face shields. But the pivots, like you say, there were pivots every day. So day one, we found the polycarbonate we needed from a place in Erie. By the time the purchase order got to them, somebody had sold it from under us. Our first set of polycarbonate came from California, and we air freighted it here. So it cost us an extra $9,000 to get the polycarbonate here because we had nursing homes calling us. We had first responders calling us. We had people that couldn't get face shields because a lot of the PPE was going to the cities, not here in rural central Pennsylvania. So, you know, our first set of polycarbonate, yeah, we paid a lot of money for it here. Then we designed the, the face shield, and we had this elastic band. And so we couldn't find the elastic. And so somebody on my Facebook says, hey, Maureen, there's a little store out in Milheim with this little Amish woman. She might have the elastic you need. So we sent out our business manager, and he went out there, and, yep, Ver Verna had this, the, the, the elastic. So we bought that elastic, and so we started making it with these little buttonholes. Well, then we couldn't find any more of the buttonhole elastic. So then we had to switch the design again. And so then we had to find the rivets. Oh, we couldn't find rivets. So we had the first set were with rivets and then no more rivets. So the design morphed so many times. But it's an incredible design now because engineers just kept it, making it better and better. And so we know it's an incredible design because I was at the dentist two weeks ago and the dental hygienist is still wearing the same face shield she bought from us two years ago. There is not one face shield you see in the hospitals that people are still using the same one two years ago. But my face shields are used in two years in a row, right? But anyway, the story goes in. <laughs> yeah. And Penn State bought a lot of our face shields. So if you're in any of the labs at Penn State and you see actuated medical face shields, those are ours, right? K take care of them. They'll last you for two years. So anyway, um, the idea of the pivot. So with that pivot, we had to bring up an online sales tool so people could order them online. We had to... Built, like the facility we have right now was about nine or 10,000 square foot. We didn't have any room to make the face shields there. So I had to call the landlord and say, hey, you know, the, la the area, the building next door that's empty, can we take it? And so then we set up a month by month lease with her, depending on what was going on and how we were using that space. So it worked out for her because she got to rent some space she hadn't been renting. So anyway, we brought up this face shield line in seven days. It was an FDA compliant face shield line unheard of to do it that quick. We started f f uh, sending out face shields to nursing homes, first responders, and then people started coming to us and saying, hey, do you have one for kids? We want to put our kids in face shields. So then we designed one for kids. And then we had this sporting good company up in Danville, which is what, two hours down 80, come to us and say, can you make the face shields that fit in the, in the front of a football helmet because shuts are back ordered from China and they're at least the end of August and these kids want to get on the field. So we sold over 20,000 face shields for football players, right? Because, and, and you know, in, anyway, I won't go into the, the, F, the finite element models showing the players looking at each other. Is, is that when we were looking for the crash test for the, the bowling <laughs> ball to drop from a certain height for OSHA or something? Yeah, yeah, that was it, that. yep, because we had to make sure that it was all safe for you guys, right? And then, you know, what are hockey. They doing in those operating rooms, but now I, I understand. Know. Yeah. <laughs> and then we had hockey moms come to us. And then, um, oh, a local meat processor came to us and said, Do you have one that hooks onto um, the hard hats? And so we did that. So we just kept pivoting the whole time. I kept called it innovating, right? But it was people called us and we just did whatever they needed. I don't think we made a lot of money, but, you know, we paid the bills and we kept our 22 employed, right, which is the important. We were having that conversation that you have great people, you want to keep them, and we kept them. But the great part to it is we also ended up hiring eight or nine people. It went up to about 15 hourly people. So we kept those people off of unemployment because, as you all remember, everybody was on unemployment and it was really hard. And so these people were like, I don't want to go on unemployment. I don't want to hang out with my family, right? <laughs> so... You know, we kept people off unemployment. But anyway, it just pivoted. Pivot, pivot, pivot. Innovate, innovate, innovate. You can call it whichever one you want to call it. But that's what we did. Very cool. It was fun and a pleasure working with you on that. So as a, as a professor, just real quick, 
you know, we had to pivot, right? All of a sudden, hey, you're back, students coming back from spring break, you can't teach, you can't go in the lab. So how do you teach a 3D printing course and hands-on 3D printing when, you know, you can't have anybody in the lab there? So I pivoted and started calling my 3D printing friends who students were taking printers into their garages and basements so they could do stuff there. We connected with the Rivet, local uh, in-town makerspace that was doing that. And then, of course, now we're getting requests for, hey, face shields, face masks, respirators. So we had a few things up here that we started working with as well where we would prototype and then we're not going to create prototypes that go then in the, uh, in the operating room or ER. Nobody's going to prove that and certainly, heaven forbid, liability from Penn State's perspective. But we then had to create a network of companies that we could work with that could do the FDA and regulatory and other aspects. So it was quite an incredible journey. And every, every night, every day there was at least a dozen pivots based on what was needed, what was new, who did we find. I think one of my favorite was the, uh, the company that made the, the leotards for gymnastics. Mm -hmm. We actually had an artist uh, in visual arts that created a pattern for gowns, because those were out. They took fabric, the leotard uh, a company that did that was making fabrics uh, and then making gowns that then had to be sterilized back here. Uh, so we actually literally went into the nuclear reactor and the gamma radiation to try it in there. I kid you not. So <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> It was, it was a great time. It was a great time. We had we had uh, we had 20, uh, 20 innovations in a hundred days there. So it was uh, an honor being able to do that. So, from uh, you know your entrepreneurial uh, journalist perspective, there from talking to leaders, hearing from leaders, how did how did you pivot in that change? And then of course, you know what have you been hearing from others that you've uh, continued to talk to? So let's see, I develop leadership workshops for corporations and I speak. I was going to speak to the largest crowd at the Geneva Auto Show, which is the largest car show in the world. I was so excited. I was supposed to board a plane on a Monday in early March of 2020. It was going, it was going, it was going, I was ready. They canceled on Sunday before I was supposed to board. And then I can't tell you how many other contracts just were put on the back burner for me. My whole world felt like it imploded. But quickly, what I learned through pivoting is you have to have resilience. Who said resilience before, right? You have to be able to pick yourself back up and say, okay, plan A is not working. How do I make plan B or plan C? And currently, I feel like I am on plan triple Z at this point. But I said, OK, I speak, I do workshops, what, and it's all in person. So what now can I do? So I had to pivot to online. And I am so thankful my husband is in IT because he helped me set everything up because I did not know really how to work a Zoom workshop or um, you know, how to do any of that online. So I had to pivot that for my business. And the more leaders that I spoke to during the pandemic, it all came down to the mindset. It was, okay, this is something that feels very negative, but how can we turn that positive? And turning it positive, a lot of people think when something is happening to them that, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. I'm not gonna be able to get out of this. But if you take a step back and you realize that you have a choice and that first choice is how you see or perceive what is happening to you, that you can do it, that's the first point in being able to control something then you are able to successfully pivot. And there are different steps with successfully pivoting, but all the leaders talked about their resilience and how they took a moment to reflect, saw it as not negative, but an opportunity. And a lot of the people that I interviewed over the past two years, they are thriving, just like Maureen, just like Justin. They found innovative ways to approach their business and keep the business going. So as two leaders of businesses, how have you mentally uh, pivoted in your thinking as a leader? I think it's a great, great question. You know, one, one thing I, I forgot who I was talking to about it um, earlier today, but founders, and I think there's some of you founders here, at some point you have to make the transition from founder to CEO. And I've always, you know, I'm a happy founder entrepreneur, and 
during the pandemic, and actually prior to the pandemic, we had some challenges, uh, evolved into that CEO position. And I think one of the key things really is you got to be calm. <laughs> I think you have to be clear headed. Um, you got to really rely on your team and let them step up. They, they want to succeed, let them do their thing. And you got to listen. So I'm really lucky that I have a great team. I rely on them. I'm not a micromanager. They are smarter than me in their areas of expertise. And quite frankly, it helped. Everyone just had great ideas. And we tested a bunch of stuff. I think it's another key thing, especially for entrepreneurs that I like to share. Um, and this will relate to pivoting. When you do something, test it. So we're a culture of testing. That could be like, OK, we're going to test a stir fry. We're going to test um, something on our new app. We're going to test um, a design aspect. How does that? How does that relate to the flow of customers coming in? The mistake I made, and I made many, would be I didn't test, and I jumped in with two feet many times, and I almost went bankrupt <laughs> because I, oh, you know what? We The first 14 restaurants we opened were hyper successful. Let's just open seven new markets in one year, which we did. Um, we survived, <laughs> but it was a pretty tough lesson learned. Um, but the point is, I think testing helps you on the pivoting side. And from a leadership, you know, one thing I, I do pride myself on is I can turn my brain off and it takes practice, it takes time. I always coach young entrepreneurs who are hyper obsessed with what they're doing because I am the same way. You gotta figure out a way to, to balance it. So for me, I, I train jujitsu and I meditate, that's it. I, I like, it shuts my brain off, it's great. It helps me focus and I'm better at my job, I'm better as a leader, I'm better as a dad, I'm better as a husband. I think it's really important to find that balance because at your age and you're, you're, you guys are passionate, right? You guys are doing stuff. How many people here have their own business again or starting something? Okay, and how many people want to start something? Yeah, okay, that's enough. <laughs> you're over that 50%. When you do, and a lot of you have, you, you want, you're gonna be obsessed and that's awesome. You wanna be passionate, you wanna dive in, you wanna do your thing, you wanna, you, you wanna breathe this thing and then get everyone around you your customers and your team to be thinking the same way, but think of yourself as like a motor of a really high-end car, right? Like a Ferrari, name a great car. That's what you are as an entrepreneur, but you gotta let the engine cool. And it's really important to figure out what that is. So it'll take time, but you'll get there. Maureen. That is awesome advice. It is so <laughs> true. You do, you just need to come down and just do something else for a little bit. But anyway, um, I would say one of the best things, I have an incredible team. I have people that love coming to work. They love what they're doing. I mean, we're improving patient outcomes. What's better than that? Um, the first patient we ever helped was a 27-year-old soldier at Walter Reed. I mean, that's a good day, right? Not only we helped a human being, but we helped a, a soldier, right? Somebody injured fighting for this country. Um, during COVID, we had another, um, we are FDA cleared for a adult patients. However, doctors are allowed to use a device off-label, which means they could use it on children. So we had a doctor call us in the middle of COVID, and he had a patient whose feeding tube had been clogged for eight days. Now, a feeding tube provides medication, nutrition, hydration. What that child was getting for eight days, I don't know, right? But anyway, we overnighted the system we had him watch a video, I had him on the phone, and I was really tempered. Like, I'm like, oh, it's probably cement in there by now. It's been cooking, right? Anyway, he called me two hours later and he said we cleared it. It was a great day. That child was not in line to have surgical replacement of that tube because what they call it, they put it through his stomach wall and it hadn't healed yet, so they couldn't take it out and put a new one in. He just wasn't candidate for a new procedure. So it was a great day. But that's what my people do, and that's what they love doing. But during COVID, I had really early on, um, so a certified woman-owned business, uh, WeBank, which is the certification body, uh, had a class. You know, I think it was sponsored by Wells Fargo or something. But anyway, they had this class called We Thrive. And in it, they talked about, in a chaotic time, how to keep your team moving and all that. And one of them was to keep your team informed. So we went to a staff meeting via Teams. We were all in the building in different places, but we weren't getting together, right? And so we would do a Teams meeting every week, and everybody would tell everybody what they're doing, and then I would 
get everyone up to speed on what's going on with COVID protocols or what's going on in the area. And I would, you know, my kids are at Belfont High School. And so every, you know, Monday the, the superintendent would send out how many numbers we have in COVID, you know, what's going on there. And so I just relay it to my team. I'm like, okay, right now Belfont's still low, but we need to be careful. And then all of a sudden Belfont was like sky high. And I'm like, okay, it's not even safe coming to work, but we're all here, you know, like that kind of thing. But part of it is to make sure you have a great team Hire slowly, and if they don't work out, hire quickly, or fire quickly, <laughs> right? Fire quickly, hire slowly, fire quickly, but keep them informed so they know what's going on. It's really important. When people know what's going on, they don't talk at the water cooler about, what do you think they're doing? They know they don't need to have that conversation. Excellent. Any other mental pivots on how you approached your business and engagement? You talked about sort of the the IT changes and moving to Zoom, but did you think differently about how you would engage audiences and the types of work you would do? Yeah, I thinking differently, my belief is we are all a brand and we market ourselves every day, how you talk, how you dress, who you associate with, et cetera. So with that, I had a pivot. Okay, I'm not meeting people in person anymore. So how can I do this? How can I grow my network? One of the main core themes of successfully pivoting is your network. It's the quality over quantity. And I realized LinkedIn was the number one tool to meet people, to have those virtual coffees. So I have a question for the other panelists and even for you. <laughs> so with networking being one of the core themes to successfully pivoting, how did you utilize your network to help you through the pandemic? I found the pandemic to be this ironic time where I was more communicative than ever. And everyone like came out of the woodwork and everyone started talking. It was kind of this weird moment where everyone was like, at least for the first like 30 days, everyone kind of like had this blissful like vibe, but it was like the weirdness and I don't know. But to your point, like communication was key. So the same thing, like we were doing daily meetings with the team, checking in, one person was in charge of PPP, we were one person in charge of safety. Um, I don't know, like, to, like, I just found myself more proactively reaching out to folks throughout the pandemic out of a genuine care. I'm like, hey, what's going on? And also what I thought was amazing, in the beginning, I reached out to other business leaders in Philadelphia. Um, we needed to offload inventory. I called like Wawa, for example, I know the CEO there, help me out, or you know, a CEO of a whatever company needed help for something, cool, we're gonna help you out. Everybody really was ready to help. And I think that just really facilitated kind of this beautiful ability to work with each other. Now you fast forward today, and I was telling my wife last week, I'm like, you know, things feel like 2019 a little bit again. <laughs> Everyone's kind of back in their lane, zone, serious. So that's kind of fading away, and um, you know, you gotta try to figure out a way to still honor that. Yeah, I think uh, everyone was working together. We all wanted to succeed. We all wanted to be healthy. We all wanted our family and friends to be healthy. Um, this email chain that Tim and a lot of other people from Penn State started up was that was all it was about is what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? Ideas were flying and there was people at main campus or people down at Hershey. It was just really open and what can we do? And everyone just really wanted to help. Um, yeah, no, they, I, did, I, right? they did. I mean, it was all about the, the network and who I knew and they connected and stuff. And it's the adage of it's not who you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? And, and yeah, I will second, I mean, uh, LinkedIn became super useful all of a sudden. I mean, even more so. So every meeting that I'm in, right, you're not biz passing business cards. I'm on LinkedIn, you know, quick connect, connect, connect with everybody that I just met because then that's the follow up and, and those sorts of things. I think the probably the biggest challenge was you know, in terms of this, the uh, it, it's hard to force uh, serendipity on Zoom, right? Or Teams, you can't have the random conversation before or after, or those sorts of things. So I think that's something we're still missing and trying to figure out, and uh, we'll see. It, I thought was suggestions. Add, I, I was going to add to that. Please. Um, so in my business, um, we raise capital to to grow, and we we were trying to do a process, investment banking process, 
in like, I don't know, October of 2020 because we were doing, at that point, well, we wanted to go. And there was nothing, I, this one I realized this, there's nothing worse. I personally hate Zoom conversations. <laughs> and, you know, a really great book that I read during the pandemic, I'm, I'm sure many of you know it, um, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, which is a really great negotiation book. Mm-hmm. He's a former um, head of FBI hostage negotiations. The idea is <laughs> if you're taken hostage, you can't split the difference with somebody. Like, you better figure this out. So um, he talks about communication, and I'm going to butcher this stat, but it's something like communication when you're with somebody. It's um, it's something like 80% body language, mm-hmm. then facial expression, and then what you say. So when you're on Zoom, you really can't communicate and read people as well. And as a result, you're not getting their full attention or being able to influence the conversation at all. So we ran this process, and I'll be honest, like these, in, these private equity guys I'm talking to, they're all tabbing during the conversation. They're not paying attention. They're asking the dumbest questions. <laughs> I'm like, I just said this. Um, and I killed the process because I'm like, this is not going anywhere. This is really a waste of my time. So, mm-hmm. you know, the, and even now, it's, we're, we're hybrid in the office. So three days a week, we ask people to come into the office. Um, but when I have to have Zoom conversations, I, it's like, ugh. So I prefer just to meet in person. Yeah. It's, it's a lot easier. Creating serendipity, real quick, while we. Uh yeah, I was gonna say. Actually, we. It's kind of weird on the the Zoom team thing, right? So, I think a lot of us actually like not all day. Like the people that do Zoom from seven in the morning until nine o'clock at night. No, that's just too much. But and a lot of times, for us doing, en- we're engineers, and so we're trying to engineer things. It's kind of nice to be at your own computer and like pulling things up and then showing things on the screen. So is we have like a hybrid. Sometimes we have meetings together, and then sometimes we have meetings with teams, so we can, you know, pull things together. But the one thing with um, with COVID that we learned is we can hire people that aren't in State College or in Belfont. So we actually have a, we hired a COO, and he's in Maryland. And so of course we're always on teams with him, that kind of thing. But you know, there's different things that we've all done to keep the companies going. But yeah, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard. Can I ask a question about the COO hire? So we, we were grappling with um, a marketing person. So during the pandemic, we hired somebody. Um, she was going to go in the restaurants and then freaked out, didn't want to go in the restaurants, didn't want to get vaccinated. We're like, all right, this is a whole right. catastrophe. Um, hmm. We had to backfill the position and we're debating, like, we can get someone from anywhere in the country. We decided to make it, so we, we looked in Philadelphia, found, luckily found someone really great. Do you find, from a team standpoint, any disadvantages with having that individual in Maryland versus with you in Belfont? Yes and no. So yes, um, we have a, a, a lunch and learn. He's not there. We just had a strategic planning meeting, and everybody was there but him. So yeah, there is a negative. There. However, there's not a lot of former executives from large medical companies here in State College. Right, and so I really needed somebody that had that expertise, and I'm not going to get him to move here, right? So he's there, and so yeah, there's gives and takes. So state, central field would then talk to someone here. Mm-hmm. That's actually true. Right, yeah. right. But I have the same thing on the marketing. Like I need a marketing person, so that's what do I? I have a relative who are marketing people, so you don't want my advice. Yeah, so that's what I mean. <laughs> do you get somebody local, or do you have to get somebody we're, who's we're far away? We're pivoting our panel to personal company advice here. So. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking for it here. Hey, we're pivoting uh, the conversation. Absolutely, it's all oh, good. Yeah. You pivoted left, and come on back. So I want to make sure uh, you all have a chance to ask questions. So I'm going to throw that out there. Uh, I would like to ask one. We've talked about sort of things that, of course, everything went well and great. If there was a decision you could have or, uh, redone. Uh, over the past couple of years, anything that you would be uh, interesting in sharing on that? I wish, to your comment earlier, I'll kick this off, I wish I had gotten more data and checked with more folks and tested more before we decided that we should just move all our communications to Teams with our big group because I didn't realize that a third of our listserv was not going to be able to access Teams. So that was a bad move on my part. Yeah, that's so, a good one. And I totally appreciated how these, you know, your IT people, how can those IT people make them decisions? And here I had done it over our meeting that we didn't get that. So lessons learned yeah. everywhere. 
Well, it was really funny, too, because when the whole thing happened and they shut down and then we had a special letter that we put on our door that said we were exempt so we didn't have to shut down. But I walked up to one of my guys, you know that Teams thing that's been sitting there on all our computer screens? Uh, you better figure out how to work it because we're going to need it right now. You know? Thank you. Because you know? <laughs> like, we, we did send some people home. We didn't. There were some people that were really uncomfortable when we sent them home and they started working. I would say uh, mistakes, maybe uh, sending people home. Right, I Tough think though. sometimes. But you, but you had a few that preferred to work at home. Right, and but I think, I, I think uh, this happened for a lot of people, not just actuated. Right, you sent people home, and they had time to look for other jobs, and they might not have come back. Right, so there was a a big turnover. But then again, maybe those people would have left anyway. I, you know, they weren't happy if they were doing that. So. Um, but I do think sending people home, you lost that cohesiveness. But I mean, we were working some crazy hours. I mean, we were doing stuff on Sunday. We were working three shifts there for a while. We pushed out 85,000 face shields in about like four or five months. Yeah, it was crazy. Wow. You know? We still have 20,000 if anybody wants to buy some. <laughs> Cheryl, anything you do different? Yeah, I wouldn't wait till something is perfect to put it out. I, w mm. I wish that I rolled out some products when it was good and then tweaked them as they went. So, yeah. Okay. Justin, any? I don't know. Like, we, um, we, we were, like everyone else, went through a lot. You know, you had a good line before you, you know, hire slow, fire fast. I think a mistake I made was I waited probably a little too long to fire that marketing person. <laughs> and it created damage because there was a lot of resentment with folks who um, were coming in the office and why is she getting special privilege here? Not coming in and we have people, we have, you know, teams in the restaurants every day. So they're like, where's the marketing person? We need help. We need support. Um, I'm a very nice person. So I was like trying to make it work. But then, you know, that was kind of it. So that, that'd be it. You know, in terms of pivot, we locked out many ways. Um, we had a restaurant in Pentagon City that wasn't doing great and it was a great opportunity to get rid of it. We had a huge office in Fishtown, Philadelphia. Didn't need it, got rid of it. Um, so we were able to shed a lot of fat from that. Um, and quite frankly, you know, it was a tough time, but we saw it as a challenge and an opportunity um, to, to just streamline the operation. So honestly, not too many regrets. I mean, we really, again, like our team is great. They got after it and um, fortunately we're in a good spot today. So it's all right. Questions from the audience. Um, so what challenges do you foresee, you know, maybe coming across as you kind of scale larger and maybe open a second office? And I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you already have a second office, but if you have, then what challenges have you already seen? Can we do it? Um, so we did, okay, so I tell the story about how the, the landlord next door had the, the 12,000 square foot. We moved in on a Sunday, cleaned it up, and started manufacturing facials by the end of the week. We ended up buying the building. And so now, <laughs> so actuated in the last year has gone from um, like 9,000 square foot to we have 20,000 square foot. But the nice part, and this is a pivot, right, is we're now doing contract services for other companies. And so one case is there's a medical doctor at Mount Nittany. He had a patent. He came to us and said, I need a medical device. So we took that patent. We did all the beta testing for it. We did the verification validation testing, which is what FDA requires. We submitted a 510K for his device last week, right? So now you're like, oh my God, we just took somebody's medical device and you know, within six months, got it all the way to the FDA, which is pretty phenomenal too. Mm -hmm. So I think we learned to be more agile, right? That kind of thing. But yeah, we did expand. And so now I got to pay all those bills for the rents and I don't know, there's just, uh, the, the you bought a, taxes you bought, are nuts. You bought, a, you bought a laser cutter there at some point. We did, right? that, was, I mean. that was another one. So <laughs> as Tim talks about stuff going on here, we borrowed a laser cutter from Discovery Space. They put it into our facility and we were cutting out the plastic with the laser cutter. We ended up buying it. Yeah, we bought it <laughs> after a while. We're like, oh, we're just gonna buy it from you, you know. But it was all team, it was a team effort. It was. Anyone else here? 
Hi, I'm Chloe. Um, so you mentioned you were a history major, um, and I'm a psychology major, and I'm at a business startup um, event. So I was wondering how important you guys believe uh, your major is in college with what you end up pursuing. Thanks. So I'll, I'll, That's a I'll, great uh, question. I'll jump in there. So I, I went to Penn State not having any clue what I wanted to do. I, I kind of just was like, all right, I'll go to Penn State. Sounds great. From New York. Let's go to the middle of Pennsylvania. Let's see what happens. Um, literally what happens. <laughs> I went to Penn State. Um, I was a psychology major for a semester. I was a business major for a semester. I just, I'm, I'm a nerd. I like reading books. I like history. So I'm like, you know what? I could do this. So I, I went up majoring in history. I minored in Spanish. I moved to Philadelphia and I worked at a chocolate factory. So <laughs> point is, like, <laughs> it, it doesn't, it's great to get a background and stuff. I always coach people like, look, if you specifically know you want to be a doctor, if you know you want to, you know, whatever, like, then go, then do your thing. If you don't know, then do what you're good at or what you're interested in and things will kind of work out or do it, again, like what you're good at. Um, I got the job at the chocolate factory. I knew somebody, I needed a job in Philadelphia, so I worked under the CEO. Eventually I was interested in real estate. This is now 2005. Um, applied for a job, got it, learned the real estate business pretty quickly. And then from there, I realized I had a huge deficit in knowledge in finance. So I'm, I'm doing these spreadsheets. I don't know what the hell to do with Excel. I'm like, this is crazy. So I wound up uh, taking, oh, and I got a D in accounting at Penn State. So I took the GMAT, got into Temple for my MBA, and mm -hmm. an advisor was like, look, you got a D in accounting, you should probably retake this class. <laughs> <laughs> I literally didn't go to class at Penn State I mean, uh, for accounting. So I... <laughs> Yeah, it was like a Penn State, the State College cop walking by, like waving at me. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is insane. Um, <laughs> I wasn't a good student here. But I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> you stole the banner off the RV at Beaver Stadium. Yeah. I did that. <laughs> Many other stupid things. Uh, Anyways, um, point is so I, I took the accounting class. I loved it. I got an A. I realized I have really pa a passion about business. Like, I, n I need to know more. So I, I wound up. Um, getting a job in finance while I was going to school at night for my MBA. And it's just like you kind of follow the trail of what you love. And fortunately, it was this mix of finance and starting a business and food. And the confluence of all that led to the creation of the restaurant. So hmm. I didn't start Honey Grow until I opened the first one. I was 30. So I graduated at 21, um, 22, graduated. I came up with the idea probably five or six years later. And during that period of time, I just spent time learning. I didn't want to jump. It's just like, like kind of find the right fit for yourself. A lot of people are really frustrated that, oh, I'm not here yet. And you look at Instagram and all these people doing things and traveling the world and whatever. Who cares? You do you. And it'll, it'll happen. So, Can I jump in? Please. So 10 years ago, there was a, a statistic say, stating that the average person changes careers eight times. Now in 2022 it is 12 times and don't quote me on this statistic but only about 20 percent of people are actually working in the field that they got their degree in and as a student you have to understand where you start necessarily isn't where you're going to wind up you just have to get your foot in a door you learn as you go and you have six months to a year experience, pivot. Have that overarching goal, but get in somewhere, knowing that you might have to start at the very, very bottom. But that's okay, six months to a year, and then you pivot. You have all that experience. And I get this question a lot is, well, what value as a student do I bring to the table? You bring so much value. I stink at social media. And your generation, and I'm a lot older than you think, your generation is great at social media. You guys have 20,000 followers. I am struggling to get three, right? So just that alone, if you go into business to any company, that's what you bring with you. You were able to pivot in a time in school where you had to learn how to do classes on Zoom, the majority of you right? You bring that resilience. You bring that leadership. And everyone's a leader at a certain level. It's just your capacity of leadership. So 
where you start, it's okay. I went to school, undergrad for business. A year later, I moved out to Hollywood thinking I was gonna be the next Steven Spielberg. I had zero film experience, but I went for it because I believed I could do it and I started working in Hollywood. It had no, my business degree had nothing to do with it. My parents are like, what did we just pay for? I'm like, I don't know. I should have gone to <laughs> NYU film school. So don't be frustrated. Explore, your 20s are for the adventure. Try different stuff, but just know you're not alone right? 80% are in the same boat as you. Yeah, a degree, a degree is not a career, right? So. And I would say do something that makes you happy and do something that matters and you'll figure it out. It's a path, right? It's, and it's a zigzaggy path, right? So. And, and sometimes it might go backwards a little too, right? Oh, uh, there's no problem going yeah. backwards either. Ba backwards is okay. But yeah, it doesn't. I'm probably the only one sitting here that like my degree is material science, right? But I'm the CEO, so I love the business stuff, right? I, so I don't think I do do some of that science stuff still, but I like the business stuff. It's just what makes you happy. Other questions? So I had a question related to um, Honey Grow specifically. Um, I think it's no secret that the pandemic just slash the hospitality industry in half, basically. Um, but personally, I think that it was a much needed push into like a more technological side. Um, would you say that for your business specifically, do you think that it was helpful, like the pandemic? Like, was there a silver lining to it in any way? It's a, it's a good question. I'm curious, did you dance in Thon? <laughs> I did not, but I just participated in doing it. There you go, I, uh, I danced a long time ago. <laughs> It was brutal, 48 hours of my life. Um, I was Thon chair for my fraternity, it was fun times. Um, anyone from Delta Chi in the house? No, that's good. <laughs> they wouldn't be here, so. Um, I, yes and no. So I think with the pandemic, it accelerated a lot of tech technology. So we invested more in our app, we invested more in our kiosk, we invested more into the stores to handle third party delivery. Um, that's good. The, the bad side, and you see it with Starbucks, right? Like Starbucks lost a lot of the hospitality because it really jumped into the whole drive through and technology. And you know, when I was younger, I remember Starbucks like blowing up all over the place. And it was like, what is this place? And it was great. And there was like this hospitality. It was awesome. So I think some of that has waned we really try to emphasize um, that perspective. So Chipotle had this restaurant tour program. We literally copy and pasted it. So it's, I don't know if anyone ever worked at Chipotle, but it's um, basically the idea of like, you, you wanna find a culture within the four walls of top performers who are empowered within their environment by their GM more or less. Um, so to your point, I think it's good for us that a lot of companies are focusing more on the tech side and less on the people because it gives us a competitive advantage to focus more on the people to create better experiences for the customers. Um, right now, the biggest challenge we have is inflation. It is out of control, and I don't want to raise prices. We did it twice last year, 3%, 3%. 3%. Um, construction costs are out of control, so again, we're opening up seven restaurants this year. You know, it's up 20%. So, it, you know, it's, it's labor prices up, materials prices up, and unfortunately, that falls on you, the customer, and we don't want that. So another competitive advantage is, well, how, how, much, how much can we maintain until we have to do it again? And that's another pivot. You know, I, I hate raising prices. Um, and right now, gas prices, everyone is driving. Gas prices are out of control. You know, it's like $5 a gallon in Philadelphia. It's, out of, it's completely ridiculous. So I think technology, you'll see more of it to reduce humans working within the four walls, unfortunately. And again, I kind of see that as an advantage for us that we can focus on our team. We have some price elasticity, which allows us to have a competitive advantage to give customers better experiences. Silver lining for your company or your company? Is everyone's talking about the pivot, so. There you go. Here I they am. Need <laughs> you. Yeah. I, I help companies well, well pivot their perceptions, so yeah. <laughs> So I think our silver lining from COVID is what we're asking, right? 
is actuated did this growth right we went from the 9,000 square foot to the 20,000 square foot and now we're offering our services to other people that's great right so we're going to be known for not only improving patient outcomes but helping other people improve patient outcomes that's a good day good mul multiplier and way to scale yeah, so yeah. and make money doing it too exactly all, all the better exactly exactly but we have the infrastructure so right here in central pennsylvania there's not a lot of medical device companies right no. and so we had to build our own entire ecosystem and so now we're offering it to others here or wherever right other questions from the audience so um, this builds on something uh, that was said earlier and, um, and it's a bit of a selfish question I started building a startup last year. One of the things that I think I struggle with um, is you know, the speed of making decisions, right? So uh, I heard you say uh, hire fast, fire, you know, uh, hire slow, fire fast. Um, s not specifically about those people management type of things, but in general, as you're m building a business out, making decisions, do you find that the speed with which you made decisions early on versus how you make those decisions now, has that changed? Um, or, or, or is there always sort of that analysis paralysis that you have to deliberately sort of walk away from? Uh, Andrea, you can do it. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, it's a great question. So pre-COVID and now post-COVID, it's different speed than during COVID. So during COVID, when we're bringing up that facial manufacturing, it was fast, right? So we had group meetings at, uh, once a week, but we had like facial meetings every day at three o'clock, right? They were. And we were just making decisions like, okay, we can get it here, we can get it here. We paid nine thousand dollars for to ship stuff over here, right? That was ridiculous, but we did it anyway, right? Yeah, that, that works, right? <laughs> yeah it works, and we <laughs> help people, right? I mean, that first shipment went out to nursing homes here. That was, you know, they were taking care of all these elderly yeah, people. The, the picture <laughs> you and the ambulance drivers. Oh, that was, awesome. yeah, that was a good one too. Yeah, that was a good one too. Yeah, yeah, awesome. we helped the police. I forgot the police took it too. Right. Um, and the, the shipment to Penn State was really awesome because the truck wasn't big enough and they had to bring another truck and load it up. But anyway, because we didn't charge them for shipping. They just came and picked it up. But anyway, um, the I, I go by a lot of my gut. Does I feel good? I'm, I like people and if I feel like that's a good person, that kind of thing. Um, however, hiring, and this is why I said to do it slow, we have a, a process. And so every person we hire has to be interviewed by five people that work at the company, and it's five. Sometimes there's six, right, depending. And then we debrief, and we say, will that person fit our corporate culture? And that's why I say do it slow, is you want to make sure that everybody there has the same mission of improving patient outcomes, and they want to be there. So we had somebody that didn't want to be there, and he didn't stay very long, right? Um, but that's important to be methodical and be, have processes and make sure you do those things right. And then as you're starting up the company and you have um, – like documents, you know, founder documents and things like that. You want to make sure you got all the legal stuff so that it doesn't bite you later. Um, but I do do a lot by gut. Like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's do it. I just want to add, you, you nailed it with fit. Like, so going back to hire slow, um, I can't stress enough how important fit is when you're building your team and understanding who you guys are and where you want to get to. Um, I learned that running the restaurants and I made the mistakes when I went build our corporate team, we had a group of people that were not the right fit <laughs> and it took time to get it right. Um, and that's something I go slow on. So it took me, I don't know, a long time to find our new VP of finance because we want to make sure this guy is the right fit, understands our culture. Um, but to your point also during the pandemic, okay, um, GM has COVID, what do we do? Like, okay, close the restaurant. Like, that's it. You know, like, you can't mess around. So you had to move quick. Um, I think a lot of it also, because I, I have the same challenge sometimes, and you don't want to be the CEO who can't make decisions. So a lot of it is going into your discomfort zone and pushing through. And I mean, I mean I'll just be honest, like, I, I don't want to sit there and figure out, I mean, before I came here, we were looking at a site, and um, it's in Maryland. And I have one person who likes it a lot, one person who doesn't. And I'm like, I know this is going to be a whole thing. So um, we kind of delayed it. But right there, I'm just like, nope, forget it. That doesn't make any sense. So it's not always the right decision, but do the math on it. And if you can back it up, cool. But just you got to, you know, just got to do it. Well, we're, we're coming to the end here. Um, Cheryl has something we want to do first. But before that, let me prompt everyone as well to give you a moment to think about any 
closing remarks or anything. So Cheryl, please. All right. I want to go back to my initial question. I'm going to ask it again. How many of you, after hearing what pivoting is, hearing the stories, how many of you have pivoted in your, in your life? All right. Now, not all of you raised your hands for pivoting successfully. So what I would like is everyone to stand up, even my panelists, stand up, or fellow panelists, I should say. All right. Here's what husband too, sorry, you don't yep, get out. Yep. <laughs> so here is what I would like you to do. I want you to try and like spread out a little bit if you can. All right. Let's let's see if we could do this. Plant your right foot. Now, I want you to go to the right. Come on, swing yourself to the right. <laughs> you're right, who's you're right. Who's so right? You plant, <laughs> you plant your right foot. Plant. And then you go to the right. There you go. Go to the right. Go to the right. You should be in the front. How many of you now have successfully pivoted? Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for indulging yeah, me. He's still facing the wall, <laughs> well, but we'll get, him, we'll get him later. <laughs> Closing comments, thoughts, summary. Panelists, it's been fabulous. I've learned a lot. Much appreciated here this evening. Anything? Um, I would say to those that are starting up a company or wanting to start up a company, and I've said it before, right? Do what you're passionate about, do what will make a difference. And if you believe you're right, your gut says you're good, keep going and don't let somebody tell you you can't do it. Because when they tell you you can't do it, they're wrong. Because Excellent. you can do it. Excellent. I would, I'm putting myself in your shoes. Um, this is my real first time back in 18 years, basically, at Penn State. So it's been a very surreal past five or six hours for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of bad things. But I was thrown out, BFC, a couple times. But more importantly, so I think, um, what was your name again? You asked the question about kind of what do you do? Chloe, so I think your question really hits home for pivoting and, and relating back to you guys. Um, I think for me, there was a whole path into getting to where I am today, and the universe works in a weird, really funky way. And I think you, you just gotta, when you do it, do it well. Spend this time right now learning, mastering stuff. Be a sponge right now. Be a sponge. Don't get off course. I'm not saying, you know, what, just use this time to really absorb stuff because the creative ideas will flow and you'll have some structure. So for example, I couldn't have created the business if I didn't understand that accounting stuff, right? I do finance stuff every single day. Use this period of your life right now to really be a sponge, learn as much as possible. Um, I think Cheryl said it, you wanna get your foot in the door somewhere, go. It doesn't matter what it is, you just go. Like Chocolate Factory, cool, it's a, it's a starting point and you could build from there. So don't rush to the finish line. Anyone, anyone here do jujitsu? Nobody? All right. Like to submit somebody, it's like nine steps. Um, don't go in right away. You're, you're going to fail. So just take, take your time on those pivots. It's important. Back to jujitsu. Excellent. Please. You are all human. We are all human. And I think the idea of being perfect has gotten out of control. And it's okay to make mistakes. If you are not making mistakes, you are not growing. But it's when you make the mistake, how do you handle it? Do you shut down and you don't want to continue? Or do you say, okay, here's what happened. Here's what I learned. Here's how I'm going to act moving forward. And that's the biggest thing is just keep going. When I went out to Hollywood, right, zero experience, I applied for all these internships, and on my very first interview, I was so nervous, I kept calling um, a future potential boss by the wrong name, and then at the end of the interview, she said, oh, my name is Susan, and I, oh, but still, I- Still remember it. I still remember it, yeah, <laughs> and because uh, I was mortified, I was driving in the back in the rental car going, what did I just do? No, I did not get that internship, but I got a cooler internship, but I always, that stuck with me that, okay, 
now I have to really learn people's names and not get so, I was just so nervous, but we are all human. It is okay to make mistakes, own it, but just keep going. Don't let it hinder your progress. Cool, thank you. And with that, can we get a round of applause for our panelists, please?